اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ الذي كان موجودا قبل حدوث الاشیاء ويبقى بعد فناء الاشیاء تفرد بالاولیت والقدم وسما كل شئن ما عدا بالفناء والعدم كما قال زشانه كل شئن حالق الا وجهه وكل نفس ذائقه الموت وقال كل من عليها فان ويبقى وجه ربك ذو الجلال والاكرام سبحان من لا يخفى عليه اختلاف النيات ولا يعزب عنه معاصي العباد في الخلوات سبحان الله الذي منه خلقه العباد واليه المعاد فمن يعمل مثقال ذره خيرا يرى ومن يعمل مثقال ذره شرا يرى نشهد ان لا اله الا هو الملك الذي لا ينازع في ملكه ولا يضاد في حكمه يعذب من يشاء بما يشاء كيف يشاء ويرحم من يشاء بما يشاء كيف يشاء تعذيبه المسين عدل وعفوه تفضل ونشهد ان محمدا سيد المرسلين وخير المبشرين والمنذرين صلى الله عليه واله الوداد المهديين من ركب سفينتهم نجا واحتدى ومن تخلف عنها ذل فغرك وهوى اوصيكم عباد الله بالاعتصام بالتقوى فانه هبل متين وعروه الوثقى قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفركان الحميد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا ايها الذين امنوا اطيعوا الله واطيعوا الرسول واولي الامر منكم امنا بالله وصدق الله العلي العظيم السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته our discussions have been on this ayah and that is o oh, you who believe the ayah of surah an-nisa ayah number 59 when allah says o oh, you who have brought faith obey allah and obey the messenger and those vested in authority from amongst you our discussion has been on the tauhid and the shirk of uh, doing shirk in the obedience itaat of allah for the last couple of weeks and we have discussed an extremely important aspect which we began last time and that is the authority of rasulullah muhammad mustafa sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sallam the very basic introduction shows us that in order to be in obedience to allah it means also to be in obedience of all those whom he has commanded to be obeyed and it also means not to obey any of those whom allah has commanded not to be obeyed there are personalities whom allah has mentioned specifically like rasulullah obedience to rasulullah On the other hand there are certain personalities whose traits and qualities have been expressed like the ulil amr. Last week we discussed two authorities that were given to Rasulullah by Allah. First is his legislative authority which as an example we said the ahkam of Furwadin which are mentioned in general terms in the Quran but it is Rasulullah who has expounded upon them and has shown us how to perform them. to get in towards the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala salat saum hajj zakat are all examples and the second is the administrative authority which was given to rasulullah for him to make final decisions in all administrative social as well as political matters we discussed the principle that allah has given rasulullah wisdom and the power of judgment and thus he always practiced justice rasulullah was advised to consult people in social and political matters however believers were also commanded that the final say was going to be of rasulullah only 
people have to obey the messenger both in divine revelation as well as divine wisdom. Today we move one step forward. And we look at the ayah of Surya Nisa, which is ayah number 80, a couple of ayahs after the one that we just recited, in which Allah says, وَمَنْ يُطِرْ رَسُولَ فَقَدْ أَتَى اللَّهِ وَمَنْ تَوَلَّى فَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ عَلَيْهِمْ حَفِيظًا Whoever obeys the messenger, whoever obeys Rasulullah, he has indeed obeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whoever turns his back in whatever matter, whether it is the ahkam, whether it is the legislative authority or the administrative authority, whoever turns back, so we have not sent you, he tells Rasulullah, that we have not sent you as a keeper over them. Rasulullah is only one who has to give the message. He is only a messenger. He is not responsible for our actions that we may perform or otherwise. This ayah is very clear and simply emphasizes the wilaya, the authority of Rasulullah as unconditional upon us at all times. And there are no reservations to this. Whatever Rasulullah gives, Allah commands us, take it. And whatever Rasulullah forbids, Allah says, shun it. It also establishes that obeying Rasulullah is in direct obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In any matter, if we go against what Rasulullah has said, done, or has accepted it, that it be done in his presence, then we are actually being in disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On the other hand, he also complements the status of Rasulullah that he is free from responsibility of what we do, what we undertake to do or otherwise. At the same time, this is also an establishment that Rasulullah is free from any errors, diseases, <coughs> or anything that man may attribute to him. Unfortunately, some of the people during his time even attributed that he has become his siyan, billah, that he is delirious. What he is saying, be it in sickness, that his sickness has gone to his brain and he is delirious in what he is saying, billah. The mission of Rasulullah is only to deliver the message and enjoin us towards Allah's obedience. When we look at the revelation, to further emphasize this point, we look at Surah Najm, in which Allah, in the very first couple of ayahs, says, "One Najmi ida hawa, ma dalla sahibukum wa ma gawa, wa ma yantiku anil hawa, in huwa illa wahyun yuha." I swear by the star, Allah says, when it goes down. Your companion does not err, nor does he go astray, nor does he speak out of his own desire. It is not but a revelation that is revealed. Rasulullah never in his life uttered anything or even made a gesture to anything except that he represented Allah's will which was revealed unto him. When we look at this principle, <clears throat> and we look at the previous prophets who had told us about the coming of Rasulullah. We let us look at two major examples. One is in Deuteronomy, which is reporting that Nabi Musa salam, says, Then the Lord said to me, that is Musa is reporting now, I will raise up for them a prophet like you, one of their own race from amongst them, and I will put my words into his mouth. He shall convey all my commands to them. He does not speak of his own will. This is what Nabi Musa told his people in expectation of Rasulullah. Whilst Nabi Isa, then this is mentioned in John chapter 16, where Nabi Isa told his people, however, when he comes, that is when Rasulullah comes, who is the spirit of truth. 
He will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but will tell only what he hears, and he will make known to you the things that are coming. Sometimes Rasulullah spoke of the revelation. Sometimes he just gave, gave us an indication. For example, in the tafsir of these first few ayahs of Surah An-Najm, Ibn Abbas reports that one day after the Salat of Isha, Rasulullah informed the people and said, At dawn tomorrow, a star will descend on the earth from the heaven. On whomsoever's house it will come upon, he will be my heir, my successor, and he is the divinely commissioned guide. The star descended, and people went on rooftops to wait for the star to come upon their own house. But it never did. It came to a specific house. And the star came and descended upon Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam's house. It is at this time that the hypocrites of Medina began to whisper that in love of Ali, Rasulullah has gone astray. Naudhu Billah. It is at this time again that the verses of Surah Najm were revealed and Rasulullah is mentioned as a sahib, a companion, because he was living amongst those people and he was a part of that people. And they are addressed in this verse. The verses assert the infallibility of Rasulullah in his movement between the creator and the creation. He is our link to our creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He neither deviates at any moment and given time, nor does he say anything other than what is revealed unto him. He does not even make a gesture beyond that. The degree of his realization and knowledge, like Agha Medipuya says in his tafsir, of all that which has been created is as perfect as the creator, save that the finest span, there is a little line there between the finite and the infinite. Rasulullah is finite, whilst Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is infinite. It is also a hadith of our sixth Imam, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq salawatullahi wa salam alayk, which is mentioned in this tafsir when he says that it was in this state the command rela relating to the wilaya and imama with finality was revealed to Rasulullah Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the tawfiq to be in the obedience of Allah at all times. Ya Allah, grant us the tawfiq to be able to comprehend the teachings of Rasulullah and be in his obedience at all times. Ameen, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad Lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakullahu kufwan ahad. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi alladhi la ilaha illa hu al-halimu al-kareem. Ghafiru al-dhambi wa qabilu al-tawb. Wa huwa al-ghafuru al-rahim. Subhana man sabakat rahmatuhu gadaba wa basata al-yadayni bil-rahma. Subhana man lam yukallif nafsan illa dun al-wusia. Wa ana wa afa'ani al-sayyati wa lam yujazi biha. سبحان من لا يزداد ولا معاس لباد الله كرما وجودا ولا كثرة الذنوب إلا فهم وصفحا نشهد أن لا إله إلا هو العطوف ولا الإباد بجودي والأواد ولا المذنبين بحلمي ونشهد أن محمد النبي هو حبيبا سيد المرسلين 
و شفیع المدنبین بعثه رحمتا للعالمین صلی اللہ علیہ وآلہ الداعین الى سبیل اللہ بالحکمت والموعدت الحسن قادت الامم وولیاء النعم ومعدن الرحمة مؤمنین today we want to speak about a particular dua in which our fourth imam imam zainul abidin salawatullahi wa salam alayk has taught us to seek a very interesting issue of life and we have heard this dua some of us or inshallah most of us also recite this dua and we also say it when somebody dies as a dua for the marhum and the dua is for us for the living as well and this is what we recite on tuesday mornings when Allah, when imam teaches us to ask allah and say allahumma ij'alni min jundika fa inna jundaka humul ghalibun waj'alni min hizbika fa inna hizbaka humul muflihun وَجْعَلْنِي مِنْ أَوْلِيَائِكَ فَإِنَّ أَوْلِيَائِكَ لَا خَوْفٌ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ Ya Allah, make me a part of your flock because surely your flock alone wins. Take me in amongst the group of people dedicated to you because beyond the shadow of doubt, your party alone makes progress. And finally we say, and this is the dua we also say for our marhumin, make room for me amongst your intimate friends, awliya Allah. Because certainly for your friends there is no neither fear upon them, nor will they grieve. Now, before we go into the dua, one of the principles of any dua, is the twofold. One is that whatever we seek from Allah, we first need to strive towards achieving that. And secondly, we are told not to negate or nullify any of our efforts by doing anything that will go against that achieving of that goal. These are two issues which are the same in one principle of any dua. For example, and this is not restricted to risk, when we ask Allah, Ya Allah, grant me barakah in risk. Ya Allah, grant me wus'a, plenty of risk. What we need to do after the dua is we need to go out, struggle and make an earning and make a living for it. At the same time, we are told not to nullify our efforts in getting that risk, not to do anything that will nullify that efforts. And therefore, it is a principle not for risk only, but any dua that we seek from Allah. So we look at this dua, and we go back to the Ahlul Bayt, because they are our door, they are our explanation. When there was a time one day, when the companions of Rasulullah, Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one of them asked Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, who are the close, intimate friends of Allah, awliya Allah, who will have no fear upon them, nor will they grieve. Rasulullah has given a detailed explanation about this, that who these awliya Allah are. Yes, the Ahlul Bayt alayhimu salam are the benchmark, they are the epitome of being awliya Allah. But we need to travel that path and that is why we are asked to seek that dua. And Rasulullah says that it is those people who look at the inner aspects of this dunya. While other people, those who are not awliya Allah, look at the apparent aspects, the physical beauties and pleasures of this dunya. The awliya are concerned with the eventual outcome in the akhirah, while those who are not concentrate for this life, by working in this life for this life. He further explains that the awliya Allah die while in the world they have love or they have no love for this world. Through the fear in the world may through the fear that the world may kill them. They have no fear that the world will kill them. 
and they also refrain from anything in this transient world. They refrain from those things of the material world that they feel will abandon them and they refuse whatever is offered to them from it in this world. There is nothing in it that tries to cheat them, to make them higher, except that they try to bring it down. Anything of the world that is promising to them, they, do not, they are not deceived by it. The material world is worn out to them, and they refuse to renew it, and the world is demolished in their sight. So the question is, to comprehend this explanation, there is a further explanation to this also, but to be able to comprehend this aspect of our lives, how can I, as an individual, travel towards becoming close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be counted amongst his awliya, his chosen friends and intimate friends? The ulama explain that there are two words we must understand first, and that is khawf and huzn. Khawf means fear, and is used in, relations to, in relation to events that will transpire in the future. Khawf is for future, while Hosn is grief that is used in relation to the past. So, we come to this. The Imam has introduced these people to us by saying these intimate friends of Allah, the awliya Allah, are those people who have certain characteristics. They don't have khawf and they don't have hosen. And one of that is that some people worship this world, material world, whilst the awliya Allah are those who are looking at the truth beyond this world. So we ask, what are the practical aspects of this? All this explanation is good and rosy. What we need to do is to achieve this lofty station. Do we need to divorce this world altogether? The answer is not at all. Allah has created this world and our life in this world as a pasture so that we may sow for, the, for us to reap in the akhirah. And that means that we need to inculcate certain values and ideals in our life. And Allah has given us to ask not for monetary or materialistic aspect of everything in life. Many times we hear this. Time is precious. Time is money. But money is not everything. Monetary and materialistic aspect is not everything in life. When we do goodness to others, including towards the creations of Allah other than human beings also. We have to make sure we are not doing it for our own fame, our own power or monetary returns. A common statement when somebody is asked to please help is, what's in it for me? What's in it for you? You are asking Allah, you are asking the creations of Allah for a return for whatever good you do? When the person who is actually whom you are asking has limited resources which was also given to you by your Lord. So why not expect from that unlimited resource who is going to give you multifold and don't ask what's in it for me. Do it with the question, will this action please my Lord? That is how awliya Allah think. When we look at Allah's blessings, and this goes across the board, when he gives us, for example, health and strength, we need to, do it, we need to use that health and strength to help those who are less fortunate, the crippled, those who can't do things on their own. We need to help them, not for a monetary return, but to please Allah who will give us multifold. When we are doing anything in this world, whatever we do, the wealth he has given us, we need to be generous, generous with it by employing the sifat of Allah, of him being a kareem, a generous Allah. 
when he gives us position and power, we need to be more compassionate, more than ever before, because we are in a position. And we have to go even beyond justice. What we need to inculcate in our lives is not to evaluate everything in, on physical merits, but rather beyond and look at the spiritual merits. <coughs> Ulama has explained that many times we get a question, why do I need to go to Karbala for ziyarat? Or why do I need to go for hajj at all? Can I not do my ziyarat sitting at Hussein Islamic Center, for example, or sitting at home? Of course we can do it. Yes, we can and we should salute the Imam and all our aima at all times. And then the question is not, does not end there. It goes on further and says, do I need to spend so much money going there and going through all the difficulties? What we need to understand is that there is a spiritual aspect of that journey that can be achieved when we undertake that journey. And there is going to be a change in our lifestyle when we go. Unless we are afraid that that spiritual change will be such that my entire lifestyle will change and I'm afraid of that change. Many times, when we ask people, why don't you attend namaz e jamaat And we are told it takes us 15 minutes to drive. It's an exaggerated 15 minutes, but we accept that. To drive to the center and 15 minutes to return. And we spend so much fuel driving our cars and we waste time coming to the center. We do pray at home. We don't miss it. Some smarter people even go one step forward and say, is it wajib to be in namaz e jamaat No, it is not wajib to be, to be undertaking namaz e jamaat Nor does anyone accuse you that you do not perform your salat. It is the spiritual benefit that comes with joining jamaat there is a benefit from the time you make the niya of going towards jama'at until the time you return back home. There are many ahadiths that we can discuss in some other time, inshallah. But the biggest issue is what Rasulullah Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself has said. He says one way to get our salat accepted by Allah is to join jama'at so that because when he accepts the salat of one in that jama'at, he accepts for all. And when, on the other hand, there are numerous ahadiths that emphasize this point and say that when one leaves towards jama'at, Allah gives countless blessings. Bi ghairi hisab, he says, towards those who come. When we come to learning of masails of deen, oh, it is boring. I know it all. Do we? If we really know all the masails, then why are there so many issues that happen in jama'at? Why are there so many issues that are happening during saum? Why are there so many complaints that we get that the, our salat is being broken because of somebody else's mistake? We need to learn this. We need to remind ourselves all the time because these are laws and we need to learn them. Muminin, we, have, we feel blessed in Orlando here that we have sessions every Saturday and every Sunday after Maghribain. We discuss masails of fiqh and we discuss many other issues. Inshallah, we hope everyone will come. The pertinent question here that we need to ask are we expecting Jannah and a place near the awliya of Allah? We say, I want to be near awliya of Allah. Are we expecting a place near awliya of Allah without making any effort for it? Will it ever happen? 
We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the tawfiq, to be able to understand the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt salam and implement them in our lives. Ameen, Ya Rabbal Alameen, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi, Ya ayyuhal ladhin amanu, sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. اللهم صل على سيد المرسلين وشفيع المذنبين نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وعلى إمام المسلمين وقائد الجر المحجلين أمير المؤمنين علي بن أبي طالب وعلى سيدة نساء العالمين وبدت خاتم النبيين سيدتنا فاطمة بنت رسول الله وعلى ست الرحمة وإمام الهدى الحسن والحسين سيد شباب أهل الجنة وعلى إمة المسلمين علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي عليه الصلاة والسلام اللهم صل على مولانا صاحب الزمان ما هي آثار البداية والتغيان هذه بابن شرك والنفاق حاسدي فروع البغي والشكاك صلوات الله والسلام عليه وعلى آباء الكرام متصلة الليالي والأيام اللهم اجعل اللهم عجل فرجا وسهل مخرجا وخل ناذرنا بنظرة من عليه واجعلنا من المستشهدين بين يديه وتفضل لعمرائنا المؤمنين بمزيد التوفيقات وازدياد الأقبال وألوف الدرجات اللهم افعل بنا ما أنت أحلو ولا تفعل بنا ما نحن أحلو بجاي محمد وآله الماسومين صلوات الله عليهم أجمعين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والأصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر